Hey everybody, it's Tabitha. I just finished part one of a series on Reiki with Ash Marshall Odell. She tells us what is Reiki, how to find a good practitioner, and what you might benefit from. See you inside. Welcome back to the CPTSD podcast, everybody. I'm so grateful you're here. As always, save, like, share, subscribe, whatever suits you so that this free information can travel far and wide to help people everywhere we go. I am really excited today to be sitting with a colleague and friend of mine, Ash Marshall Odell. She is an expert in Reiki, and we're going to be talking a little bit about complementary and alternative medicine throughout this podcast series. And I wanted to start off with two things. One, a professional I trust, and two, Reiki, because it is very widely available and can be remarkably supportive in your healing journey. So Ash, welcome. You are a author. You've written a book called Light, oh, I just lost it, oh, Lightbound, there we go. Like I would forget that, right? Lightbound, a healer's journey. And in that book, you discuss your travel realizing you had complex trauma and then the process of healing through that and where you ended up is as a Reiki master, um, as well as other, other things. Would you tell us just a little bit about your journey? So for me, um, I had been doing talk therapy on and off for gosh, 20 years <laughs> and not gotten as far as I would have liked. And then I had my daughter, which for most people, when you've had childhood trauma, you know, that can sometimes um, trigger, you know, some things and um, was determined to raise a healthy kid and be a healthy mom. And so I decided to do th more therapy. And I just happened to find this pretty amazing therapist who did energy psychology and she ran a trauma group. And that um, really opened the door for a lot of things for me that I had never experienced before because I'm from the South and conservative. And the most out of the box thing I had done was um, chiropractic and acupuncture. So having this new type of relationship to myself um, through energy psychology really truly launched my healing journey mm. in the stratosphere because I had just gotten kind of stuck and could not move past. And I didn't even understand why I didn't understand what there was so much. Um, I want to say confusion and uh, just doubt about everything um, in regards to myself and my journey. Mm. And I had serious anxiety. So general anxiety disorder was that um, second diagnosis with the CPTSD and um, I was kind of terrified of just about anything and everything it seemed like it was kind of really crazy and uh, really just pissed and didn't even know that either. Like I had so many emotions, like, you know, just basically all of them, including a lot of shame. Mm. So all of that for what I had endured yeah. in early life, um, which had begun even before I was able to verbalize. So a lot of the things I experienced were pre-verbal, which when you're trying to talk at therapy doesn't work because there's no languaging for what you experienced. Yeah. None. It, and it's yeah. generalized. So it's it huge. Oh my gosh. It was crazy. And this great therapist that I had really helped me to gain perspective tools that seriously, truly transformed so much for me, like in every respect, um, it was pretty brilliant and, um, got lots of support and modeling of how to handle things, how to talk, how to be in a relationship to myself first and foremost, and then how to have really healthier relationships with others. Um, so it was truly transformative and, um, got into meditation, which Holy smokes, that was hard. <laughs> yeah. It's remarkably hard to learn how to meditate when you have complex trauma. Right. So just, I mean, I just want to pop into our audience and say a couple of things real quick, if that's all right. Please do. Okay. The first is if you are um, seeking a diagnosis from a professional of CPTSD, you will not get it because it doesn't exist right now, even though we all know it exists. 
Right. And so I just wanted to throw that out that, that probably what you will get is PTSD chronic, mm. as well as some other things like generalized that account for the other symptoms of CPTSD, like generalized anxiety disorder, depressive disorder, things like that. So I just wanted to throw that in there because it's a confusing process. The other thing is, I am so grateful you found energy psychology. It saved my life too. Thank so you. when you started meditating, I bet there was challenge there because for those of us with <laughs> complex trauma, we've got a narrowed window of tolerance, including quiet for some of us. So what happened? <laughs> I'm a huge uh, cartoon fan, especially the uh, Bugs Bunny and Yosemite Sam. So, and I was very much sort of my own. Um, I, I likened spirituality in the beginning to uh, boot camp. I think I called it spiritual boot camp. So it was sort of like, you know, I would tell myself in a, in a way, it was sort of the idea of drop and give me 20 maggot, you know, like the drill sergeant <laughs> kind of thing. And so I, I had read all these different things, uh, how to meditate, what to do. And this one book says, count to 10 and don't have a thought like for, for 10. Dang, I get to six and have a thought. And I'm like, oh, you know, and I, I get lost and forget, you know, you're supposed to concentrate on your breathe. So count of in and out cycle of breath one, that's, that's one. So I get to six, boom. And then according to this book that I read, you have to start all over. So <laughs> <laughs> I had some frustration eventually, and it took a long time. I'll just be clear about that. I can't even quantify. I know months I was able to get to 10 and then I was like, Oh, I did it. Holy cow. I did it. And then I got like 20 and then I got to 30. And then there were times, you know, where it'd be like, oh my gosh, I can't at all. And what I didn't understand was the, um, the emotions that run through us are also hormones and anxiety. You get triggered. And if you've had complex post-traumatic stress disorder or chronic or however they mm -hmm. call that within the D. Yes, DVS. I don't know how you say it's that. It's the DSM, and you're you're doing great. <laughs> <laughs> um, it will when you're trying to sit. It'll just and so I liken it to like NASCAR, you know, with those zooming around the track. Only it's your internal self, and you're like, oh my gosh, and it's like you're coming out of your skin because it's you know you, and uh, it can be kind of a challenge. And then there are other days, you know, you don't get enough sleep right? That affects all of it. You know, if you've had a rough day or a rough week, or if you have a lot of stuff coming up within you, because quite frankly, the healing journey can often be like that. Uh, I liken it to a party snake can. <laughs> <laughs> so you pop a lid and all this stuff flops out and you're like, holy crap, how do I deal with this? You know? Yep. And then you look down and there are some more cans down in that original. And so it's kind of like a Russian doll snake party cans and you're just like oh my god you know <laughs> i saw a pez dispenser of cans <laughs> it's not yummy candy it's not it's just <laughs> not <laughs> so yeah and it's it's really uh it's really difficult and so and how you believe affects everything how you feel how you think how you act and you don't even know you have these beliefs because I used, um, came up with this thing, you know, it's like wearing glasses and they're like, it's almost like they're glued to your, your body. You don't even know they're there. And they're like hundreds of lenses and they can be different colors or patterns. They could have thin films on them or stickers. And so maybe you have one with a crack going across. And so you move differently based on what you perceive rather than what is. And so when you're healing and learning to uncouple, all those beliefs, peeling lenses out, things get clearer for you. And you start choosing differently because that crack that you were accommodating, because that's what you thought was actually what was there, right. it's gone. And now you are freer to choose differently. And that even in itself requires healing because you're like, I don't know what to deal with this. Like, I, I feel happy. Am I, so, wait, what? Right. Happy. I feel great. I feel I feel lovely in my body today. Whoa, what do I do with that? <laughs> yep, yep. And I mean, th that I love that you're bringing that up because I did that just the other day. I'm like, this thing just happened. I feel like I should be stressed out about it, but I'm not. And I'm slightly stressed out that I'm not stressed out. That <laughs> is exhausting. <laughs> and I knew what I was doing at the time. So I just like backed out of it. So, you know, 
Um, but it can be exhausting to go into what advanced integrative therapy calls the void, which is that space after you've healed. Who am I? What do I do now? And yeah. it's a great space to be in because there's usually some relief of suffering in that spot. But also, guess what? The burden of you being a human who is responsible for your decisions is now on you fully, right? Like you have an awareness and so you therefore can take action. But I digress. I just wanted to say something real quick about meditation. If you have any type of neurodivergence, you absolutely will need accommodation for, for meditation. So for example, I tend to be toward the ADHD end of, of neurodivergence or highly sensitive person type of divergence, which I do realize a lot of people think that HSP is an ableist term. I'm researching that um, because I'm not quite sure where I land in that whole uh, schmattering. But my point <laughs> is, for those of us with neurodivergence, the kind of meditation that Ash is talking about working towards can be beneficial to you and, and maybe something you want to practice. But there are other forms of meditation, such as a moving meditation. And the goal of meditation is for you to be doing what you're doing right now only. Meaning, one of my favorite forms of meditation uh, here in Oregon is to go berry picking. Hmm. And when I am berry picking, I am only looking for the best berry. And I just let everything else go. But that hyper, it, there's a little hyper focus there too, of course, <laughs> right? But my point is you can walk a labyrinth. You can walk around your block. You can stim however you do that. And that also can be a form of meditation. The goal is to be here now. That's what meditation is about in my book. So Ash, thanks for letting me pop in with my meditative thoughts. Um, I think I want to ask you a tough question for mm -hmm. our audience, because some people in our audience may not have ever experienced or heard of Reiki um, and may not know how to choose a practitioner. So I have two major concerns with complementary and alternative medicine. And you and I have talked about this before, so you're not going to be shocked. Um, one concern is that there's no regulation board for that. That doesn't mean it's bad it, at all. I've been helped by things that are not regulated, you know? So I'm saying, however, though, you need to be very mindful about how to pick a practitioner. So we're going to get there in just a second. How would you pick a practitioner? But the other thing is some practitioners like to even therapists. So this isn't just sit cam people. All right. Some healer professional type people like to tell us what's going on inside of us instead of helping us discover that. What do you think about that? What's your approach there? So the first part in regards to Reiki itself, I'll just gently quick talk about overall what it is. So oh, Reiki thank is you. A, not a problem, is a set of frequencies. So if you were to think about Hertz, which is a measure of vibration. So light waves are measured in Hertz. Um, emotions are measured in Hertz. Um, brain waves are measured in Hertz. So is Reiki. So it's a set of frequencies that you are attuned. And attuned means made conscious or aware of. So that really is what it is. And these frequencies um, are attuned to you, heart, hands, and whole self, and you carry them with you wherever you go. And they help you, and if you are a practitioner, help you to help others make dynamic energy shifts, which, or vibrational shifts, if you prefer. So uh, letting things go essentially is just the easiest way to describe that. And um, as far as the challenge of choosing a practitioner, I'm with you on that. Um, it, it can be. So first of all, always, you know, look at reviews. Mm -hmm. so said. Second, find someone that offers a free 15 minute consultation, because this is just like you would a therapist or anyone else. It's a very deep and personal kind of relationship, right? That that person. And so being able to get a feel for them, if they are the right fit for you, because this is your journey and you deserve to have someone that you feel completely comfortable with. And third, if you've had that first session and you don't feel um, like there's any difference or, or you feel different um, 
as far as, you know, if you feel worse when you, than when you finish or the same or something, or you, you don't have any kind of feeling that it's better than when you began, consider that that might not be the best fit for you also. And sometimes you don't experience things in a conscious way, um, but you'll know how you feel in your body, right? So if there's just not a a positive feeling there for you, then yeah. And there is the international um, Reiki training center.org. And I'm so sorry. That's not the exact name. <laughs> I will send the link for that. Okay. Oh, no problem. And thank you. We'll put it in the description below. Absolutely. Okay. And second part of that question um, was... Oh, remind me. <laughs> no problem. I'm just saying, I was saying that sometimes therapists and healers of all brands like to tell us what's happening instead of helping us discover ourselves. And I'm warning against that. <laughs> That's what I'm doing. Clearly, if somebody says, no, it's not that it's this, and they don't know you, and they're wrong, flee. I'm wondering what, like, in general, I know every Reiki practitioner is different, but in general, is it in Reiki's premise that you discover what's wrong and then tell the client, or is it more about facilitating the client's journey? That's the real question I'm asking there. So I can't answer that except that in a way that there's two different things here. So some people come to receive Reiki. There is no discussion at all, you literally lie on the table and you relax. And what the Reiki practitioner does is when you're attuned to Reiki, you are able to process the energy information. So you're first attuned to your hands mm -hmm. and that information that you receive. So if I'm scanning, that's a thing in Reiki where you take your hand and you're scanning, which sounds crazy, but it's kind of like if you were to go into like a um, an x-ray or an MRI and you see things, except you're not really like seeing, like I see this inside of you, there's this big thing. It's more that you feel the vibrations and you're aware and you're like, oh, well I have this sets of frequencies with symbols that use to help release this. So that the flow of energy through that individual is reestablished, you ground them, you balance them, you align. And this is all about chakras. So um, I just want to pop in and say, in some senses, what you're talking about can be like a hand free massage. It is exactly like that. And a lot yeah. of people experience, and sometimes that is exactly what people require yes. is when you are stressed out and tense all the time, your whole body is like this. And after a while, you don't realize how freaking tense and stressed you are. And when you receive Reiki, you are able to release all of that. And just be, I, I have had clients report, they feel like they've been floating in the clouds and they're blissful and they just are like, ah, oh, and that's a fabulous, fabulous feeling. If you do other types of things in addition to Reiki or combined modalities, which, you know, a lot of people do, sure. um, the goal is one to just help person, you know, shift whatever they're ready to shift and to help them become released, healed, and empowered. That's just my personal thing. And to empower someone is to help them to know for themselves, to have that conversation and awareness in and of themselves, what's going on. Mm -hmm. So say, for instance, I'm working with a person, I'll be like, I've noticed this, like, or they'll describe, and I'll be like, can you please put your hand here and ask this part? So say, for instance, they're having this severe pain right here, or it feels like there's an intensity or a pressure or prickles, they'll feel something, you know, there. And I'll, I'll say, can you please ask this part of you? What would you like me to know, understand, or feel? And I tell them, you might get images, uh, like a sight of a movie clip or a smell, feelings, um, words, um, all kinds of things. Like a person, I've had people say, oh, I see this person. And we're like, oh, and there's this realization as they connect to it because all of this translates to all the different things. So mind, body, emotions, and we store these chemicals and the brain fires neurons. And so if you tune into a part, 
and you ask it, you can receive information from yourself. And that is the important part is to help you connect. Because when we start connecting things within ourselves, we begin to become aware and empowered to notice change and choose differently than we have before. And that truly is where you are able to move forward in your life. And that's the goal. So Reiki is, in my perspective, a tool to help you release, heal, and empower yourself to be your most authentic self, to feel free and feel love and openness and wonder and to just help you feel better because really there's no optimal, perfect, I'm going to be free forever. And this is awesome because it's, it's, that's just not how life works. However, that being said, you feel better and better and better in your body and your being. Yep. And that is phenomenal. Yep. And it's worth the effort and the time it takes, because I really want to make sure as we're talking here to some people who may be hurting very deeply and on top of the hurt you've already had, you're hurting, realizing that you've been hurt right? And how deep that can go. That when you're saying you should feel better when you walk out of a Reiki session, the first several sessions with a good provider, you may feel more relaxed, more calm, maybe nothing deep comes out. It's an introduction into your body and into feeling what your body is telling you so that you can put that with your mind and work as a whole being to heal. And so I just want to reassure people that if you try Reiki once and you aren't all better, that's not what this is. No, 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 no. This is a repetitive process, just like therapy, because we have to be able to understand something about ourselves, accept it, integrate it, and then move on to the next layer. And that's how it works throughout time. And so I just wanted to reassure people that if you're not walking out fixed, the first time you have Reiki, you didn't do it wrong. And it may not be a horrible practitioner, right? I, I, unless you have a really bad vibe from a practitioner and it doesn't feel safe for you, I would give people two or three times because sometimes we need to adjust to receive the treatment. That is very, mm -hmm. Yeah. And when I say feel better, you should, what I would was meaning in that first part is you shouldn't feel worse than when you came in. You should feel better, right? Not worse. Yes. So everyone experiences what they will experience because mm-hmm. what is present within ready to go is what will occur in that session for each person. And that can be all different kinds of things. And it's never the same session to session ever, ever. That's true in therapy too, if you're doing good work, you know, so one, I just really want to keep reaffirming people who may be new to Reiki or new to healing CPTSD, that the first experiences you have with therapy or Reiki or massage or anything that is trying to help you unearth what's deeply bothering you, your results may be dissociation, distress, overwhelm. And so my point in saying all of that is not to expect that when you walk into your Reiki session, but if that happens again, it may not be the Reiki. It may be you opening up, which is terrifying for us in recovery. Do you have any thoughts about that? Um, Like people dissociating on your table, anything that you would like to add? Um, What most people experience when they come in, because I combine a multitude of modalities and it's whatever is going to serve the client. That's always the highest priority is the client, what's coming up for them. So it's, it's not always just one thing, right? Right. So, um, as far as people dissociating, um, people have experienced what they call bliss. And I don't know if that's necessarily dissociating. They just feel like they literally floated out of their body into space. And like, they just, it's like a, and, um, some people cry because for the first time, when you release things from the body, it's that flood of emotions and those chemicals. And so they'll cry. I've had people laugh. I've had people laugh and cry. Um, I've had people go, oh, and be like, 
oh, you Mm -hmm. know, and then they're able to let that go because they're like, oh, I didn't even know I was feeling this. And then we're like, oh, you know, and it's, it's that connection for them. And for me, when I work with clients, um, if it's not just like two or three sessions, often there is a component of therapy involved. And I will be like, um, you require therapy now, or you require to go see an herbalist, or you require to go see the medical doctor, or you require this because our journey as we clear ourselves requires different things along the way. Always. I mean, I can't, there's never going to be like a one thing does it all for you because we are a complex organism with lots of moving parts. And as things change within us, we often require additional assistance to kind of help get that optimal um, wellness and well-being within. And so, yeah, I mean, I have personally, I will speak to my own journey because that's, that's cool. Um, when I first started, um, that was hard. Um, I have taken earth tonics. I have taken turmeric and milk, uh, weed to help my liver. I have taken, uh, it's an anti-inflammatory and, uh, excuse me, milk thistle and a liver supporter. So a fortifier to help because I was so mad for so long. Right. So it took time. And, um, I was in intense therapy for almost like eight years with one person. And then I still go now. I will, I just finished up some. So when I feel I require that, I go back and get more because that helps me to move forward and to deal with a chunk of stuff that's come up. Because as you keep healing, you get new awarenesses, you get new information about yourself, which can be challenging. Mm -hmm. And when you have processed it and released it and integrated all of that learning, you're like, hey, and you realize I have more capability. I am empowered. I am enough. I'm deserving. I'm more than I'm freaking awesome. That's <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> right? I'm, I'm so glad you had that experience. I'm so glad. Well, it was so, not easy. <laughs> no, it's not easy. And it requires effort. And I started saying effort instead of work because we've already worked enough. <laughs> if you know what I mean, we've That's already worked true. enough. And so we just have to apply a little effort to redirect the boat. So we're coming to the end of part one. Mm. And I just wanted to um, recap a couple of things I want our audience to take away, which is when Ash is talking about using supplements, those are not things we subscribe. I don't disagree with supplements, but we're not telling you to go take milk thistle, right? That needs to be determined by <laughs> You were clear about that. I'm just being extra clear. Okay, Okay. great. (laughs) Okay. Um, That requires somebody who knows what they're talking about to support you. And um, the last thing I wanted to add about what you were saying, Ash, about reading reviews is two things. One, look beyond the stars into what the people say, because you will find clues there if they feel heard, if they feel like the practice was fair to them, if they, you know, those types of things that may be important to you um, as you're starting to get into perhaps other services. And the last thing I would say about following, finding a qualified, <clears throat> excuse me, practitioner is please ask them if they have a referral source, just like Ash is describing. I do as a therapist have referral sources for, for a doctor that will actually listen to you <laughs> for an herbalist, for a chiropractor, for an acupuncturist. I mean, I have all of those ready to go because I'm not the one to provide that to you. Your Reiki master can have that same type of list. Do you have a list like that, Ash? Or how would you reckon? Yeah, I know. <laughs> and you I just said you did. Trying to add to that also, um, because often, you know, you start referring people and people are like, oh, and they can fill up. So adding others, you know, is I think helpful because when you refer someone out, you would like them to be able to receive what they require to help them. Right. And being those multifunctional and dimensional beings that we are, we deserve specialists Mm -hmm. who have dedicated their life and passion to understanding how modalities help us. So I'll get off my soapbox there. 
Ash, we're going to do part two, where we talk more specifically about the Reiki protocol that you created called Pranic Reiki. And I think that um, that's going to be an intriguing conversation, including ancestral healing, maybe some DNA reformatting <laughs> that we can talk about. So if y'all in our audience are interested in that, please definitely catch part two of this interview with Ash Marshall Odell. Is there anything you'd like to say as we're headed into part two? Learning to love yourself truly and deeply and being open and willing and curious to explore, even when it's kind of outside what your comfort zone is, can open up your entire world in ways you would never have thought. Yeah. And you can handle it. Yeah, you can. Thank you, Ash. We'll see you in a couple weeks. Thank you. You're welcome.